They're able to see things uh, from a different perspective and lens that doesn't feel so self-persecuting or overwhelming, uh, miserable, as you said before, so that they approach it with a, with a different capacity than maybe some of us do. So can I ask a question? You're going to anyway. Right, right. <laughs> 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 good point good point right right right, right. i don't know why i'll oh. give you such a hard time today I'm just i'm laughing i do love you <laughs> <laughs> i do love you i know you know and you know i love you too <laughs> and that's from the doopy deep of my heart right <laughs> the doopy deep of your heart no, but, and it's what i know to be true and, amen here's the thing i'm wondering What's the incentive for someone like myself to practice self-care? That's the first part. And there's another question. But can we just address that one for a second? We're we're telling the listeners that this is important. But what's the incentive to do it? I would imagine the incentive is not to feel so horrible and crappy every day. That, That would be enough for me. I mean, that's a real simplicity. I was really thinking. <laughs> here I was thinking I was going to sip my afternoon tea, but no. <laughs> I guess she's done. <laughs> Quick sip. <laughs> that was real. That was real basic to me. Real basic All right. to me. So what were you thinking? Second. You always have like you always have like this ulterior motive in your question. So what were you thinking? No, I was no. You know what? Well, I say, of course, but not for this. I really was just thinking, you know, why would someone want to do this work? Because I don't think oh. that either of and, us and, are sitting and, up here and saying it's not work that one has to do. Yeah, that's so what I was going to say. Let's take that pause and make note of that. So, you know, there was uh, I was in a, a more a more heightened stressful time in my life a few years ago, uh, like literally two to three years ago. And I remember kind of reaching out to folks that uh, were that were in my life, not necessarily like my most intimate, you know, like inner circle of friends, but people that are in my life that I that looks like they're managing things well, they that they are have a healthy and balanced looked on thing perspective on things. And so I was, you know, I was like, I'm really struggling with like how to really embody this work of self care that it sounds really good, but the process of putting it into action and, and doing it the right way is harder than it sounds. And so I want to know, like, how do you do it? Like, how does it really show up for you? How do you do it? And a lot of people responded back by saying, yeah, I don't have a good answer. And yeah, you're right. It's not as easily done as it is said. So I do want, I, I appreciate you acknowledging that it is work and it, and it is, uh, it's an, it's an in, intentional set of behaviors. The reason why I think the intentionality is important. And the reason why I think it is work is because I don't think things are set up for us to engage in this sort of behavior. I think that like the, I always call it the machine. There's always something or some something demanded of or someone demanding something from you. Everybody is tied to a family in some way, shape or form, whether that's whether you're in the role of being a partner or spouse or whether you are a parent, whether you are a child and giving care, every, every, a sibling, everybody is tied to family in some way. That can be one of the areas in your life that is demanding attention, that is requiring something from you. Um, If you are working, no matter what your level of uh, profession is, um, how elevated or, or quote unquote not elevated that is, there are demands of you on the job. For some folks, those demands continue once you leave the workplace. You're expected to work and return emails. You're expected to work on the weekends. You're expected to be self-sacrificing. All of these things, I think, have become a little bit of commonplace. And then you're expected to show up for the happy hour to celebrate your friend's birthday and bring the gift and all of those things. There's always going to be demands on you that are part of the machine. And so in order to opt out, in order to take the time to actually care for yourself, to prioritize yourself, it takes conscious effort. It takes intentionality. 
especially if you want to do that in a way that maintains those relationships, especially if you want to do it in a way that is also compassionate and considering of um, and in consideration of those important relationships. Now, follow up question, because, you know, I'm all about the paradigm shift. So here's the metaphor. A person has diabetes. And better yet, I'll make it personal. When my mother was diagnosed with diabetes, Mm -hmm. the doctor said to her, you need to change the way you eat. Eat a little bit more of this, a little bit less of this, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And um, in the ride back home from the doctor's office, I said to my mother, well, you know, you heard him. You need to stop eating this. You need to start eating this. You need to do this. You need to do that. And she said to me, it's funny. He's now asking me to do the things that if I had been doing all along, I wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. Hmm. So take that and then take the person who starts dieting, who hops on the, I don't know, do people still do Atkins or did Oprah just knock it out the box with her? <laughs> no, it's called, uh-uh, it's called something else now. What do they call it? Uh, Keep. Okay, it has another name. Okay, they don't so call one it of those activity. quick diets, like mm-hmm. a South Beach or something like that, where you or a smoothie diet or green tea diet. Let's use one of those, where you do it for two weeks. You could easily drop ten pounds if you do it right and you exercise. And I know people who've done it and who've lost lost the weight quickly. We're talking about the chronic versus the acute. In looking at self-care, how do we convince people to do the work to deal with the chronic and Mm. stop focusing on, as you said earlier, those acute things? Hashtag spa day. Hashtag Uh just got a massage. Hashtag eyebrows waxed, right? Like (laughs) those things that we see as self-care, but they're really that quick diet. Right, right. Okay, I can can totally work with that because that is part of the underlying problem. I think the reason why, uh, so those, those sorts of discrete activities that you just talked about, I, I, I put them under the category of like self-indulgence or or maybe even self-soothing a, a little bit. The, yeah, I'm going to go off into all the caveats and nuances there could be around that. But I'm going I'm to, for the sake of this conversation, put them under that big heading of like self-indulgence uh, rather than this bigger idea of self-care. The reason why those things are really stop gaps, they're like band-aids on a gaping wound, is because more often than not, they're not dealing with the underlying bigger issue, which which I think is people's response to overall chronic stress. I think we are uh, collectively more stressed out and more stressed out on a chronic capacity than we ever have been before. Um, and there's some evidence for that, that um, the Harvard um, School Medical School of um, Public Health, uh, they did a study where they asked people to, um, I'm sorry, no, this, this comes from my very own. The American Psychological Association um, does an annual stress survey. Um, and in 2016, the survey found that about 25 percent of Americans were experiencing high levels of stress while another 50% were experiencing moderate levels of stress on a regular basis. So overall, we're all, in, at least in this country, experiencing chronic stress at a higher rate than we have before. And experiencing stress, I think the problem with stress as a, as a concept is that we use it so cavalierly, like, oh, I'm stressed out, even my... Even my little one talks about being, well, sometimes I, I think she's finally figured out, but she used to say, and this is when she was like four, 
she would say, mommy, are you stretched out? Like she would say, say the word stretched and not the word stressed, um, which I thought was a perfect like yes, word substitution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for noticing. <laughs> But there, no, what happened was there was a moment where, like, I think she was asking me for something or she needed something. It was in the middle of me doing a whole bunch of other things. And maybe she, I remember standing at the refrigerator. So she must have asked for a snack or something to drink or something. And I remember saying, babe, I just need a minute. And I just turned around and kind of just faced the refrigerator and was trying to, like, focus on my deep breathing and get myself back together. And that's when she said her little voice behind me. She was like, Mommy, are you stretched out? And I was like, sweet girl, yes, I am stretched out. And I thought it was an appropriate uh, mispronunciation because I think sometimes we feel like that. We are stretched Right. Beyond in right. so many different ways, and overtly, mommy is stretched. <laughs> mommy <laughs> like, is stretched, and you are stretching by just this question. <laughs> so, mommy needs a second <laughs> just to work on her elasticity, right? <laughs> Bye. Uh, yes. So, the, but the thing is, I think we use the word stress so like commonplace. That we don't recognize that we're actually like it, like stress means something. It means something emotionally. It means something physiologically, and it has real impact on our health, psychologically and physiologically. It has a real impact on our capacity for well being, and it's such a part of how we do things and how we are that we take it for granted. That this idea of like health and wellness sometimes looks like contradiction from all the things that are expected and demanded of us. It looks like they are an exact contradiction of those things. And the the rule of self-care is trying to figure out how do you do that in balance of what's required of you, but in a way that keeps you healthy and sane. You know, I just want to also say that when you're talking about this concept of um, stress, hmm, we all know these ones and I know that you know because we know some of the same ones right <laughs> who oh my god I'm so stressed out I, I, I just I have to buy those tickets and I have to do this and I I forgot to do this and I still have to get my hair wrapped and blah 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 blah, blah and they're going through all of this stuff and you're sitting back and you're saying you know there are people who may not be able to make the rent this month mm -hmm. and you're stressing what hotel you're going to do you're going to book on that trip to i don't know dominican republic whatever you know mm -hmm. so as a psychologist and you could speak to this much better than than uh, anyone else could when you talk about stress, are we talking about real stress, perceived stress, <laughs> as, opposed no, to fa as opposed to fake stress, as opposed to that <laughs> fake stress that be up in those streets? No, but seriously, <laughs> is it? Are we talking about real stress, perceived stress? Um, do the intersections of mm -hmm. economics? And race, culture, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. What are what are those nuances around stress? Mm -hmm. So the 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 answer. Yeah. So the answer yeah, is how both. Does that affect that? Yeah. The answer is both. Like perceived stress is stress. The body doesn't know any difference. The the autonomic nervous system responds the same way. The difference is what one perceives as stressful and what the other perceives as stressful may be different. There are some things that happen that by and large across the board in the human experience we find stressful. There are other things that are, I, I think, contextually and culturally bound that contribute to our perception of stress. So let's say, for an example, if uh, there's an experience of uh, a microaggression. So you, you brought up these issues of like race and ethnicity and all of the other, all of the other ways that our culture show, shows up in important um, contexts in our lives and, and intersects with all the beautiful parts of who we are. Let's say you're in a workplace. You are working in a high power job. 
you uh, there are lots of demands on you and uh, there's a deadline coming up. The account for which the deadline is set up is a really big account. It has a how you.